Now I request a uh, Kumari Ishani Datta to present her paper and uh, I will be happy if you can finish in the, within 20 minutes because we are running uh, out of time. By 1.30 at least we should close this session. And if any more questions, uh, I will answer later whenever I will get time. The questions are very easy to answer, not difficult. Thank you. Please, Ishani Datta. Firstly, I would like to thank Sudarshan sir because he has set the premise for my presentation. However, before beginning, I would like to mention that I have no formal training in Sanskrit and I have just begun learning the same. Thus, inclusion of any shlok from the Ramayana in this paper was done from a translation. Uh, my paper is titled Reviewing Sheldon Pollock's Philology in Ramayana and Political Imagination in India, Questions Related to the Exclusion of the Aesthetic Through Pollock's Appropriation of Valmiki's Ram Rajya. This slide uh, depicts a brief outline of my presentation. I will begin by referring to the claims Sheldon Pollock makes in his 1993 essay, Ramayan and uh, Political Imagination in India, written in the aftermath of the demolition of the Babri Masjid in 1992, regarding how the Valmiki Ramayan was not, not only provided an idiom for the ideologies of early Indian imperial politics, especially that of Ashoka, but has also provided the primary impetus, and I would quote, uh, for political mobilization in the name of a Hindu theoca theocratic politics against what they thought of as the other population. In other words, Pol Pollux is a subjective reading of the Valmiki Ramayana as a social and political weapon. Next, I will go on to refer to how Pollock justifies such a reading by bringing into play the claims of his philology in three dimensions, which he later came to write in an essay with the same name in 2014. Both these bring it down to the fact that, on doing so, Pollock neglects and transgresses the basic tenets of critical theory on which philology as a discipline is based and the long history of existence of the Valmiki Ramayana as Adi Kavya in the Sanskrit canon, which is a testimony to its aesthetic dimension in his reading. Uh, thus, the Purvapaksha will comprise of a brief outline of Pollock's claims in both his essay and his theory, on which his essay is based upon, the basic premise of uh, his philology in three dimensions, and his main arguments in Raman and political imagination in India. To contest this, I will look into the probable sources of Pollock's theory in uh, philology in three dimensions, which will bring into discussion Theodore Adorno's aesthetic theory with uh, Pollock's theory of philology in three dimensions. These will finally lead us to the existing gaps in Pollock's subjective reading of the Valmiki Ramayana that can be treated as the red flags. Uh, coming back to Pollock, himself claiming that his essay Ramayana and Political Imagination in India is a subjective reading, he states, how such a mythopolitical reading was necessary because the course of the political life of the Ramayana theme is not known due to the lack of sources that examined, and I quote, the theme mythopolitically from the putative origins of the Sanskrit version to its regional language treatments, unquote. The other reason apart from this for justifying a subjective reading that has been mentioned by Pollock in Philology in Three Dimensions, where he states that only when one reads, and I quote, Forms of literature that are maximally distance in, distant in time and space, philology becomes maximally present." Unquote. Now, his subjective reading, as I discussed in one of the previous slides, makes a claim that the Valmiki Ramayana from an early period has been continuously and readily been supplying a repertory of imaginative instruments for articulating a range of political discourses. These symbols are specifically the figure of the warrior god Ram, his birthplace in Ayodhya that directly links this to the question of the Ram Rajya. These are what Pollock believes to have been the primary impetus for the divisive political discourse that he claims was used by a trained group of Hindu militants to attack and ultimately demolish the Babri Masjid. That is, to maintain the sanctity of Rama's, Rama's birthplace and his Ram Rajya, and the need for the liberation of this site from the perceived other. A few points specifically need to be noted here. Firstly, that even though Pollock in the very beginning of the essay admits that on the whole this demolition had nothing to do with antagonism between Hindu and Muslim communities, he is unable to hold on to this throughout, which could have led to a more rational mythopolitical reading if at all, and gives way to his emotional outbursts, which results in his making a claim 
that there isn't any other text in South Asia that has ever supplied a vocabulary so politi uh, for political imagination remotely comparable in longevity, frequency of deployment and effectivity. In doing so, yet again he repudiates the traditional view that Valmiki's Ram Rajya was a land of social harmony where upholding dharma was of supreme importance as a result of which Ram needed to be a king first and uphold his duties pertaining to this before anything else. However, Pollock still maintains throughout the essay that Valmiki Ramayana is fundamentally a text of othering wherein, and I quote, Ram was the chief of righteousness and Ravan was the one who makes the world weep and fills it with terror and thus needed othering along with the rest of his clan. And thus beginning from the Ratyatra in 1990 to the demolition in 1992, such images were used to create the binaries of the self and the other. That is the Hindu self in the Ramrajya Ayodhya vis-a-vis -vis the Muslim other. Before moving on to the gaps and the red flags, it is necessary to look into the basic premise of Pollock's claim that, as I stated before, is based on his framework of philology in three dimensions, in which he puts down three interpretative dimensions to make sense of text, historical, the te text's latter readings by tradition and the subjective or the personal. In the essay elaborating this framework, Pollock mentions how over time he has been tempered by a critical hermeneutics of understanding and a neo-pragmatist conception of truth, which has prompted him to conceive of a philological practice that orients itself simultaneously along three planes of text's existence moment of genesis, reception over time, and presence to his own subjectivity. Now, uh, philology uh, in three dimensions and philology as a discipline formulates one of the basic tenets of critical theory or literary criticism that can be traced back to Theodor Adorno and the Frankfurt School, which developed in Germany in the 1930s. And philology as a heightened sense of self-awareness arises in direct proportion to the time-space distance that separates the philologist from the origins of the text. This claim, heightened sense of uh, self-awareness, uh, links back to Nietzsche and uh, the time-space distance is from Gadamar. Okay. Uh, on closely examining Adorno's aesthetic theory in relation to Pollock's theory, we will notice that the plane 3 of Pollock's theory that is making sense of a text through the presentist's own personal subjective reading here and now and the presentist dimension of meaning that is the pre presentist textual truth relates to Adorno's aesthetic theory in the sense that meaning cannot be derived without looking closely at the importance of the object in conjunction with its subjective connotations. Similarly, plane two of Pollock's claim making sense of a text through the readings of its earlier readers, the text tradition of reception, the tradition's dimension of meaning and the traditionist textual truth is related to Adorno's aesthetic theory in the way that art must not be solely defined for the objectivity of its work but must be looked at in ways in which it is perceived and conceived of by a society. Uh, lastly, plane one, that is making sense of a text by way of the time and place of the text genesis or historical origin, the author's dimension of meaning, that is the historicist's textual truth, is related to Adorno in the way that art must balance itself with meaning and purpose, delving into the overall character of society, while also remembering the individual artist from whence the work originates. Only having these three planes in place can lead to a balanced philological reading is what is claimed by both. Uh, finally, coming to the gaps and the red flags, if we read along plane one, that is making sense of a text by way of the time and place of the text genesis, that is the author's dimension of the meaning, we will realize that Pollock overlooks the possible cause behind the inception of the Adi Kavya, in which an episode in the Balkan clearly mentions that Valmiki, on seeing a wailing free female croncha bird as a hunter, shot the male bird when he went to the river Tamasa for a bath, uttered the first poem unintentionally in the Anustuk Chand. This episode directly links the Adikavya to the question of the aesthetic, that is Karunya Bhava coming into play as a result of Valmiki's extreme grief on seeing the dead bird, which later took the form of extreme anger that materialized out of his having perceived the act of killing as unjust. 
Another shloka prior to Valmiki is cursing the hunter, which is said to have said to summarize the essence of the entire Valmiki Ramayana and goes as she who is ever together with her husband, a lusty male bird with flighty wings and with a prideful crest, and one who always had a heart for her, but she is now separated from him and gone is that togetherness. And she, on seeing her slain husband, whose body is blood soaked, and who is reeling on the ground in anguish of pain, bewailed with piteous utterances. This too invokes the same bhav. Reading across plane one will also bring into focus another major aspect of the Valmiki Ramayana, which goes beyond its public political aspect or even its aesthetic aspect by connecting it directly to the divine. Pollock talks about the good versus evil aspect of the Adi Kavya, but nowhere discloses the source of the good or the evil, which is revealed to the reader or the listener through Ram's discourse with sage Agastya. Everything goes back to the events in the Krita Yuga, which exposes the soul truth was held in what is referred to as the power of the word. That is, the fact that there were no empty words and every single word uttered by the gods was not only significative, but also adequately operative. Since it was a tradition where, no, where there were no written records, it was only the word that had permanence. Every word that was uttered in the cosmic realm either needed to have an effect in that yuga itself, failing in which it would show its effect in a consecutive yuga. This is the case in the Valmiki Ramayana as well, since every timeless myth, in this case relating to the words, needed to necessarily have its temporal representation. At the same time, every curse, myth and boon needed to have the effect that was due to it. Thus, the timeless myths relating to Brahma, Vishnu and Shiva had its temporal representations in Ravan, Vibhishan, Ram and finally in Indrajit respectively. Thus, the question of claiming one as good and the other as evil was not feasible or necessary. So, if at any circumstance the question of the Zedgeist or the spirit of age would arise, then that spirit of the age cannot reflect any politics other than the one happening in the divine or the cosmic realm amongst the gods and the Rakshasas. The latter is under no uh, means excluded, but time and again, the fact that one is necessary for the other's existence is realized in the absence of which the power of the word would have lost all its significance. Now, if we read along plane 2 and 3, that is making sense of a text through, its re through the readings of its earlier readers and the present is personal subjective reading here and now, that is to say the traditions and the present is dimensions of meaning respectively, we will notice that throughout the essay only once has Pollock mentioned the literary tradition of the Valmiki Ramayana and its influence on the regional languages. Though even in this, he mentions how he can prove that at, a particular, uh, that at particular historical junctions, the Ramayana imaginary came more centrally and dramatically to inhabit a public political space as opposed to simply a literary space. However, what he regards simply a literary space is in no means as simple and should have been given the consideration due to it in any subjective search for meaning. The Valmiki Ramayana, which is believed to have been composed any time between 2nd century BCE and 2nd century CE, making it a significant part of the Shruti and Smriti, Smriti tradition, has an immensely complicated history of reception, which A.K. Ramanujan in his essay, 300 Ramayana, 5 examples and 3 thoughts on translation, acknowledges by stating that the history of the Ramayana is spread over a period of more than 2,500 years in South Asia, because of which the Rama story has undergone countless variations while being transmitted across time and space, leading to more than 300 tellings of the same in South and Southeast Asia alone. This will bring us to the conclusion that Pollock seems to be selecting only those traditional voices that seem to sit, fit his values while ignoring most others. He seems to be talking on behalf of whom he considers as the other or the excluded since Indian independence, as well as in the Treta Yuga. Even though the history of the Indian subcontinent will reveal how over time the Muslims were no longer the other, thus, thus saffron politics can in no means be con uh, concurrent with the claims or the Zedgeist of the Valmiki Ramayana, where as has been explained uh, uh, previously, there are no visible traits of othering. Thus, even though drawing a swift conclusion regarding Pollock's claims will be erroneous on our part, 
One cannot negate under any circumstance that through the means of his essay, he distorts the numerous traditional voices extremely diverse in nature to a great extent. Thus, not only is he not being authentic in the manner in which he talks on behalf of Valmiki, but his claims are also not accurate about reading of the latter traditions. In this relation, not only does Pollock contradict his own position in relation to his theory of philology in his essay by superimposing his own subjective voice on the Valmiki Ramayan, which seems to have risen out of immense anger pertaining to the contemporary situation, he excludes both the divine and the aesthetic aspect of the Adi Kavya by focusing only on its public political aspect. Finally, the assertion made, assertions made throughout this paper can be rightfully summed up through Rajiv Malhotra's claims in the battle for Sanskrit, wherein he says how the philological theories developed by the neo-orientalist school of thought, which try to empower social groups considered as the other by the neo-orientalists themselves, such as the Muslims, the Dalits and even women, are merely a guise. And what these theories do in reality is to pit these very social groups not only against Hinduism, but also against each other. Rajiv Malhotra also claims that this becomes extremely evident in the works of Sheldon Pollock as he tries to purge the ancient Indian literary tradition, that is the Sanskrit tradition, of its sacred dimension, thus not only refuting entire traditions but also rejecting an entire history by trying to frame the Valmiki Raman as socially irresponsible and as a project that propagates nothing but Vedic social oppression. To help me, you can do two things. You can go to the subscribe button on my YouTube and subscribe. We need more subscribers there. Uh, secondly, I get lots of emails on people saying, how do we donate? How can we help you? Uh, you go to rajivmalhotra.com or you go to infinityfoundation.com and you can hit the donate button. You can donate in dollars. There are different ways mentioned. If you want to donate in rupees, there is a column called uh, Infinity Foundation India and you click that and there are instructions on how you can donate in India.